Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome to the stage, Mr. Casey Condon! Oh! How many felt a little nostalgia there, eh? Awesome. Oh, man, I'll tell you what, just uh, some great stuff. Of course, you know, we've been reflecting back, and we're seeing some uh, really cool things. So I'm hoping you're having a great evening this evening. I got to tell you that I am always excited when I get the chance to hear uh, Mason. And, of course, I had a chance to have him here and sharing with us. Of course, you, you know the fact that he wrote our first book, of course, Diamond in the Rush. And, of course, now the new book. Right? The polished diamond in a rough. And of course, uh, we're fired up about that. Of course, he's become a dear friend of all of us here. And uh, I saw him out in the hallways. How many were out there talking with him and sharing? And if you ever get a chance to listen to him, he's truly an awesome philosopher. I know that he is, he is a TV commentator. He is a columnist. He is a, has a radio syndication. I mean, he's, this guy has really done some incredible things with his life, considering some of the challenges he's had to break through to really rise up. And of course, that's what he's done. His original book, of course, was uh, it's okay to leave the plantation. I mean, the, the, the philosophy, the mindset is just absolutely brilliant. And every time I get with him, of course, we just had dinner with uh, uh, Mason, of course, Tim Adams. How many of that would be a fun dinner to be sitting at? You know, just to listen to that high performance mindset. And uh, that's exactly what Mason is. He is an individual who's got a passion to teach people how to think and to think right. Would you please help me welcome all the way from San Diego, California, our own Mason Weaver! Thank you! Thank you! I appreciate it. God bless you. Have a seat. Let's go. I got, a, I got things to say. I, am, I was telling Casey, put me in the game, coach. Come on now, put me in the game. I'm ready. Hey, one of the great video. I got, a, I got a joke for you. Anybody here know why everybody thinks that all black folk can dance? Because those who can't don't try. You're not going to see me up here trying to move nothing, OK? I may walk a little bit. You know, I thought I would take an opportunity. My, my wife and I was watching a a video, a documentary of my life that was put together by Dr. James D. Kennedy, uh, the Coral Ridge R, right before he passed away, as a matter of fact. And we were watching this 10 minute video, and they hired actors and, and, and they reenacted my accident and what happened to me on that chip. And, and my wife was mentioning that I had not talked about that from stage in quite some time. And maybe it's a good time to let you know how I ended up on this stage, how I came to be, and what happened in my life. Just in case some of you have not read the book, It's Okay to Leave the Plantation. You see, I was in the Navy. I joined the Navy the same day Dr. King was murdered, the same day that he, he was shot. I, I, I joined to serve my country. I, I also said that I went to Vietnam to get out of St. Louis, and those of you who know, know. <laughs> and I, I went into boot camp and, and I found that it was strange because at the time, the country was at war with itself. And there was a guy on my ship who did not like me for the color of my skin. And I didn't really care about that too much. It really didn't bother me, not like me for the color of my skin. That was really his problem, not mine. And I thought he was just a competitor. I did not know that he was an enemy. I didn't know he hated me. I had been to Vietnam, and I knew what an enemy was. An enemy you either kill or you beat him over the head till he stops being your enemy. <laughs> That's really the, the, the only two things you have to do with an enemy. I thought he was a competitor. Now, I played high school basketball, and track and field and, and football and, and I boxed and I knew what a competitor was. A competitor is someone that you learn from and, and, and compete against and, and analyze and if you lost, you went back and thought about it and prepared again and went back out again. I thought he was just a competitor. Until about 9.05 in the morning, August the 11th, 1971, when I ordered my competitor to take control of 2,800 pounds of steel and metal and black iron and I stood between him and another guy in a steel wall while he controlled a ton and a half of steel. And I watched my competitor put his shoulder to it and push it over on me. I looked him in the eye. I knew that he and I had racial conflict, so I knew why he was doing it. I turned toward him to run away, and it hit me on, the, on my left hip against the wall and crushed my hips in and broke three ribs and crushed my head against the wall. And I screamed in pain and agony. And, and as I opened my eyes up, 
from the scream, I looked him in the eye. I saw the look of hatred on his face as he thought he had killed me. And that look, that look kept me in hatred for an awful long time. That look fueled hatred for everybody who looked like him. Even though eight white guys rescued me, that was not, it didn't matter. It didn't matter. Even though my doctor was white, my physical terrorist was white. Yeah, those who know, know. It did, it did not matter. It didn't matter to me. I hated. America had done enough to me, I thought, that I deserved to just hate. Now, many of you here are, are, are having some difficulty with things that happened to you in the past. And I'm going to share just my story. This is my particular private personal journey to get me where I am. It may not be relevant to you. You may say, Mason, you just gave it up. Wasn't that big of a deal? You all got personal issues that you have had to drag from, a, from childhood to adulthood, it was going to affect you the same way. I had to, when I got discharged, the Navy thought I was disabled. The Navy didn't understand, you know, that quadrant. They didn't understand that. So the Navy said I was permanently disabled. And so here I was now. Now, I didn't tell you what happened in high school. In high school, I was ready to graduate as a junior with a senior class. I finished all the requirements for graduation. I had this thing called a brain, and I use it often in school. And this, this, <laughs> but I, I went to, a, to an all-white high school, so I never knew how good of a basketball player I really was. <laughs> so, so <laughs> hey, 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 get over it. You got soccer, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so, they wanted me to come back for gym, okay? They wanted me to come back for the quarterfinals in high school, but I, I ended up quitting because the teachers really had some strange ideas about me. See, they had a different view of Mason Weaver. They had a different view of me. It wasn't personal. It was just personal. It wasn't that they hated me. They loved their kids. I remember the high school college counselor the person whose job it was to get you from high school to college. I went to him and said, you know, I am prepared to graduate as a junior. I am academically prepared. I have passed all the requirements you placed on me, and now I'm ready to go into college. He looked at me like that was the silliest thing he ever heard in his life. He said to me, put his hands on my shoulders and said, Mason, why would you want to go to college? This is the guidance counselor, okay? I'm head of my class, folks. He said, all you would do is take a seat away from a better deserving white person. Oh. Mason, let me, let me call down to the shoe factory and get you a job with the other colored boys. Now, at the same time, I'm, see, it wasn't personal. I didn't take it personally. I didn't take it personally. My uncle has a PhD. My grandma had a PhD. I knew I could go to college. He didn't think I could? OK. I quit, joined the Navy, and finished there. But the problem is that I knew there were people who wanted to stop me for their own personal reasons. Now I got this white guy, this white racist, drop a ton. You ever had a Volkswagen fall on you? <laughs> it will ruin your weekend, folks, I tell you. <laughs> I had to go back to, I'm laying in a hospital bed at Melbourne Naval Hospital, 21 years old, now unskilled, because my skill that I learned was a welder, pipe fitter, plumber. I could not do that any longer with a broken back. High school dropout. I remember I dropped out of school to join the Navy. Here I was now, poor family, uneducated and unmotivated and hating everything. I broke up with a girl, I'm talking about hating everything white. I broke up with a girl because she had a white dog. <laughs> and she was cute. But she had to go. So I go to Berkeley. And at Berkeley, I ran across other angry black men. See, you are who you hang out with. So I hung out with men who thought America owed them something. America was a bad place. America was a, a, a place that we needed to rebel and, and fight against. And we all had a pity party about how terrible America was. And I'm going to Berkeley studying Swahili and black history. <laughs> Political science on the side, you know. And I'm, I'm learning all these bad things about my country. And then I started to think. See, once you think, you're free. Once you think, you're free. And I have to deal with this person. And tomorrow, maybe tomorrow at Sunday morning service, I'll tell you the real reason how I got to where I got to. But I had to finally learn one day 
to forgive, not to demand apology, not to demand reparations, not to demand some special program of privileges for, for poor handicapped Mason, not to, every day I woke up, I had to decide that day if I was gonna take medication and go to school drugged, or take no medication and go to school in pain. I had no choices. But I had to decide what I was gonna do based on what I needed for my future, not what happened to me in the past. I found out when I forgave that guy, when I finally got over my hatred, I found out first that nobody cared. <laughs> Imagine that, nobody cared. They didn't care how injured I was, how, how bad I was, I, was, I was injured. They didn't care about that. They cared only about what I could do for them. When I found out that I had to take care of my family, myself, I had some goals of mine. In the hospital bed, I had a goal. It was a simple goal. You know, I was a young, I was the healthiest man in my high school. I had lettered in four sports every year. But my goal on August 11th was to move my big toe. Any one, it didn't matter, right or left. I took any one of them. Down the hallway was a water fountain. My goal one day was to be able to go and get me a drink of water from that water fountain. My goal was to just to do something other than lay in the hospital bed and count the holes in the, the ceiling tile. 121, if you really know how many is there. <laughs> I verified it over and over again. But I had to forgive, and now that I forgave this guy, I found out that there was a burden on me stronger than 2,800 pounds called hatred. I couldn't function in America. I couldn't do anything. I couldn't, I couldn't get on my feet. I couldn't compete. So I had to all of a sudden look at the people I was hanging with, the, the militant, angry, anti-American folks, and look at them and say, you're not going anywhere with this. And that made them angry because I was saying, basically, you're lazy. I'm going to compete in this country. I had a professor tell me that it was really tough being black in America. He said, it's tough being black in America. I understand he was white, blonde, German. <laughs> and he's telling me how tough it was being black in America. I said, gee, uh, how long have you been black in America? <laughs> it's... It's tough being black compared to where? In Germany? Is it better in Germany? Can I go there? Well, you came from, why are you here then? <laughs> what I discovered, folks, was that we have combined in America all the cultures of the world, and we have a unique culture called the American culture. In case you don't know, I'm not an African American. I was born in St. Louis, Missouri. I'm an American. And if I, if I move to Africa, they won't call me an African-American African. -American. <laughs> I'm an American. And I, and I finally found that what had to happen, I had to not look at myself as disabled. I had to look at myself as abled. And even though the school system and the professors and my friends were telling me how tough it was in America, I began to think. And, it, and the thinking, the process I began to develop Ended up in the book, It's Okay to Leave the Plantation. That was the first book. And then Policy of Diamond in the Rough is the last book. And I think you're going to enjoy the concept. What I found out, folks, was that everything I thought I could do, I dominated. And then I looked at black men. In case you haven't noticed, I'm, black, I'm a black man. You know, I, haven't noticed, I know you haven't noticed that because you guys are colorblind up here in Canada. But <laughs> it's, that, it's that white snow. It keeps you can't see straight. <laughs> but everything that black men think we can do, in spite of racism and the Klan and bad police and 40 years of one particular party's control of Congress, we dominate. We think we can play basketball. We think we can play football. We think we can play baseball. We think we can sing and dance. I started thinking maybe I could own my own business. Maybe I could actually take care of my family. Maybe I could actually become secure. Maybe I could retire early. I began to think that, and I began to move in a process to get that to happen, and what I had to do was leave people that I was hanging with. That was the hardest thing in the world for me to do, and would probably be the hardest thing in the world for you to do. And I came up with a few elements that I had to work myself through. The elements. Let's go through the elements of success. Desire. Passion, vision, preparation, courage, and perseverance. You see, first, you had to have the desire. Trust me, folks, I could have, they gave me a week to live in the hospital. 
They gave me a week to live. And then when I let, lived for two weeks, they said, well, maybe he'll be in a bed for nine months in hospital for a year. And I walked out. I didn't roll out. I walked out three months because desire. I had to put a cage over my bed so I could do pull-ups by myself. I worked all day and all night. I want to walk. Now, I, I granted, granted, my motivation was so I can get on my feet and kill this guy, but <laughs> I was still motivated. <laughs> I was motivated. You see, desire has to come. You have to be tired of where you are. You must be completely tired of it. You must desire something better. You may not know where it is. You may not know how to get there, but you know there's something better somewhere. And you've got to have that desire in you. You got to hit bottle for your bounce. So the desire in me was to do something to feed myself. This is the early 70s. My desire was to make money for my mailbox. I could not work. My disability requires that I cannot do any prolonged walking, sitting, or standing. That's why I'm continuing to walk. I got to keep moving. So I have to find a way to create income for myself. I have a high maintenance wife. <laughs> you know, she requires an occasional pair of shoes. So I have to earn, I have to be able to earn money some kind of way, so I have to find a way to create income. The desire came from the passion. Once you get the desire, the passion has to grow in you to the point that nothing will stop you. The passion will continue to grow and bloom until nothing can stand in its way. After you get the passion, then you get the vision. Now the vision doesn't go to everybody. The vision comes to the leader. The vision is, and then the people see the leadership and the direction that the visionary wants to go and they will follow you. But you must first have a vision before anybody can follow you. You must first be going somewhere before anybody else can start to go where you're going. But if you're standing there trying to make sure that your brother-in-law gets to this meeting and you've been talking to him and talking to him and talking to him, he is leading you. If you're not going to go until he goes, guess who's leading who? He is leading you. If you're going to leave Egypt, you're going to be walking towards the promised land. You're going to be getting up, going somewhere. Instead of sitting, I was sitting there waiting, trying to get all my friends. We can do this. We can compete. We, can, we had Berkeley, folks. Before affirmative action, I'm at Berkeley. I can learn. I can go to the library. I felt like I was a spy. Going to the library and actually learn how to read and wrote. You know, trying to figure out how I can control my future. I was studying and learning and absorbing. So I had to compete from these kids one day. The desire and the passion. I saw a vision. The vision, folks, is when you see the entire problem and the entire solution, like a parade, like on top of a mountain, you see everything. You're sitting there right now with, with the problems facing you, with the desire to do better, and you got the passion to get it done, and you see the vision of Diamond Hood completely. You see it all, and that is your vision. The preparation comes next. You must prepare for what you know is coming. You must act like you believe in the vision that you have. You must act in a way that's going to let everyone else around you also know that you believe you're going to be there. The next step is courage, and it takes a whole lot of it because all your friends are going to say it has never been done before. Nobody in my family ever went to college. Nobody in my family ever owned their own business. Nobody in my family ever left Missouri. Now everybody's gone. My mother has seven sons. I call them seven. She, my mother has seven BMWs, black men working. She now has 16 college degrees on the wall from her seven sons. They all own their own business. All of her nine grandkids came from marriage. None of them have been in jail. Yeah, you get that point. None of them have been in jail. <laughs> None of them have been in jail. The fact is that I was the first. And everyone said, but nobody in, your, in this family has ever done anything. I said, well, then pay attention. <laughs> pay attention. You see, folks, I had tried being broke. That didn't fit my lifestyle. <laughs> I tried it. just didn't fit. I had to try something else. So what, what happened was that the, the people around me kept trying to discourage me because they were afraid of my success. My success meant that they may be lazy. My success meant 
that all the people we had followed before were wrong. All of our heroes were wrong. All, all of our passion had been misplaced. We had been lied to. We had succumbed to being conned. All my friends at Berkeley, all my radical Black Panther friends thought something was crazy with Mason because he's, he's not down with the cause. I said, I am down with but my cause. It's, it's my cause. This is me. And I had to leave my friends. Folks, if you, if you desire to be the first one in your family to do something, everybody you know is going to think you're crazy. If you desire to be the first one in your family to go diamond, the first one in your family to retire at 30, you're going to have folks think you're crazy. When I told my mother that I was going to quit my job, my good government job, at 30 and retire at 30 and stop working, she was afraid of me. She was afraid I brought my first home at 23. She was afraid. I understood, I understood her fear, where she came from. But I said, Mama, you have done some things, and your, and your husband, my dad, have done some things and sacrificed and suffered. I'm going to stand on your shoulders, and I'm going to compete because that's what I'm required as your son to do. So I know you're scared, I know you're nervous, but it's going to be okay. I'm going to go to the top of the mountain, not to the foothills of the mountain. And I'm going to conquer it. I'm going to leave it all there for you and your grandkids to have one day. After courage. Don't forget now, I'm disabled. I can't work. I have two choices, welfare or going out here like this or making it work. I have to persevere. It's like a farmer. You know, a, a farmer will see a vacant land, a, piece of, a plot of ground full of trees and, and, and uh, rocks and holes, and he is tired of going out every day, 8 to 5, trying to get money from his hands to his mouth. Every day, trying to get money from his hand to his mouth. Every day, got to go down there and work eight hours a day for somebody else to eat. So he sees this land. He has a vision. He, he understands. He, he has a desire to make a little easier living for his family. He desires to have a better control of his life. And so he sees this land. Everyone else sees tall trees and stumps and, and weeds and brushes and rocks. He sees a farm. And so he has this passion. He wants to control his destiny. He has a passionate need to go out and try to make this work. So he puts the work into it. Three to five years, I think it costs, something like that. He puts the work into it. He clears the land because he, see the vision. he sees tomatoes here and corn here and sweet potatoes here and peas over here. And everyone else sees trees and logs and rocks and trouble and burrows and foxholes. No one sees it but him. When he starts to clear the land, people say, you're crazy. You can never grow anything. And nobody's ever grown anything here before. Nobody's ever had a crop here before. What do you mean a crop? What do you mean you're crazy? You can't do this. It takes courage to go against everybody you know, everything you know, everybody you desire to please is now against what you're doing. It takes courage to say, I'm going to make this farm work. And what does he do? He persists. He cuts the trees down, pulls the, the lumps, the stumps up. He plows the field. He plants the seeds. You've got to plant some seeds. Every time you show this business to somebody, you planted some seeds. They may not take root while you're there. Maybe a downline come by next year and get them, but then you plant the seeds, and they grow when they fall on good, fertile ground. They don't grow. You can't sit there and worry the seeds about growing. You can't say, come on, now grow. You move on. The farmer plants the seeds, and they grow. He perseveres, and they grow. But there's something wrong with the, with the farmer's idea. You see, the farmer has to, he has to destroy that crop every year in order to eat that winter. And next spring, he has to start all over again and plant the crop. He just brought a job. He just, the land owns him. But that same farmer, if he gets hurt in the wintertime, break a leg, can't plant in the springtime, he's going to starve in the summertime. He can't take time off. He can't do anything else. So he has to work hard. But he has another vision. He thinks, if I plant trees instead of fruit, put the same work in, and let that fruit tree become mature, once it's mature, I can now feed my family for generations and sit under the shade tree and talk to my kids about how to rule their world they're in. That's the desire that we have, is to plant something once and let it grow, let it multiply. Don't let someone else tell you that they can help you make what they're doing right. They must be telling you they can help you get what you're doing right. 
When I was in college, and I talk about this often, the professor kept saying to me, Mason, if I teach you to fish, you will eat for a day. Or if I give you, I keep getting it wrong, I guess it just doesn't sound right to me. If I give you a fish, you eat for a day. But if I teach you to fish, you eat for a lifetime. And I'm thinking, boy, that's odd because, see, um, I know how to fish. So I asked the professor, are you saying to me that you have to teach me or give me, and I'm going to starve unless you stop doing what you're doing and teach me or give me? I have a better saying called a masonism. Let's just open the gate onto the lake, and I would need nothing else to feed myself. Just don't lynch me when I strip the fish. <laughs> I can, see, so we don't have to have instructions because, see, freedom is natural. It's, it's natural to be free. It's a natural desire for you to go free. It's a natural transgression from childhood to adulthood to freedom. I'm a 31-year-old 30, man, and I go to my boss's office in the Department of Energy and say, guess what? I quit because I had found a way in five years to create income to match what they were giving me to go out and enslave for them. And I missed my goal by one year. I was so disappointed. I do tired at 31 instead of 30, but the concept that I found developed the skill level that has kept me free for quite a few, I'm not sure how old I am, but it's been a few years past 31. <laughs> I found out that, you know, if, if you want a, um, a permanent job, scratch a dog. <laughs> be doing it all day, permanent job. I didn't want a job. The job seemed to me, like it, it was something... You know, you know, it's okay, I guess, if you want to work 40 years for me and then give me all your money and retire broke, it's okay. I can take, take that part of it. But for me to work for somebody else for 40 years can't be a goal. It may be a requirement, but it can't be a goal. It, it's hard. It's hard to explain the human nature that will make you want to give up your natural right to be free to work for someone else. It may be required, but it can't be necessary. You see, I was in pain. I'm in pain every day of my life. Pain and suffering is inevitable in your life. But misery is optional. <laughs> I'm in pain every day I wake up. But I decide when I wake up. I'm in pain every day I'm at my computer, but I decide when I get on my computer. I'm in pain every day I have to go to the store or go get on a plane, but I decide when I want to do that because I have been free. So the pain and misery of 2,800 pounds may also be crippling to some, but only if you are a slave to someone. When I, when I got my head straight and, and realized what I was doing, I had some analogies I had to think of in my life, and you may have the same problems. You must understand that in order for you to be free, you have to act like you're free. You have to, you have to think either you're going to believe in freedom or you're going to expect freedom. Either you're going to believe it or you're going to expect it. There's a difference. You know the difference? You ever seen a pregnant woman? Ask a pregnant woman if she expects a baby or just believing on a baby. <laughs> you ask the woman, if she's pregnant, five, six months pregnant, you ask her if she just thinks she may have a baby one day. Or is she expecting a child? She expects this child to be here. She's already buying furniture, already having parties already making plans. The baby is kicking inside to get free. You cannot tell her that she is not having a baby. It is there. And she's preparing. She's acting like it's going to happen. She is have energy pertaining to the baby being born. You must act like it. You must plant enough seeds. You know, I, I uh, brought a home, my first home in California. We had a little grassy hill that kept flooding. The water kept running down. So I decided to plant some some growth cover. I had planted strawberries. I figured a grape plant is green all year. You have fruit all year long. And the birds kept eating my seeds. They kept eating my seeds. I'm out there every day shooing the birds away. You know, full-time job, keeping the birds away. Finally, I decided to call the expert, my father, the farmer. And I called my dad and said, Pop, how do I keep these doggone birds from eating my seeds? I can't get them away from the seeds. My father laughed and said, uh, son, plant enough seeds for the birds. 
That's logical to me. Now it's logical. Plant enough seeds. See, what he said was this. If you plant the seeds, if you put your idea in the right fertile ground with the right sunlight and the right amount of water and nourishment and nutrients, in about two weeks, they stop being seeds. And the birds leave them alone. Something you got to do for two months, not two weeks, the seeds germinate and become something else. If you're out there beating the bushes, showing the plan, trying to get the business working, you may think it's going to last forever doing this. But it's just a small period of time. And that seed that you've been planting all over the community starts sprouting and sprouting and sprouting, and then you're on stage holding a trophy over your head. Because you got folks following you here. You see, everyone wants to be free, but everyone don't want to do the work to get free. So you follow. Did I say that out loud? You follow. <laughs> I had to forgive. Folks, what I'm trying to say tonight is that you have something on your heart, in your background, in your, in your mind that you're holding on to because somebody has done you wrong. And you can't let it go because you want to make sure you don't get hurt again. This is a train. The train is being moved and pulled, and you hold on to a tree stump. Let the tree stump go. I don't care if your mother was a crackhead or she cracked heads. <laughs> I don't care if, you, if, you, if you've been done wrong or done. I don't care. Let it go. Because you're going to live with yourself every minute of your life. You may not be with your mother, your father, your brother, your uncle, your friends, your buddies at work. You might 30 years from now when you're sitting down at the old retirement, old Casey retirement home, <laughs> rocking on the beach someplace, grinning and smiling, you're going to forget everyone's name at work right now. <laughs> Everyone. You won't know who they are. So you may as well forget now. And, get, and, do, and do the, I mean, I'm going to give you an example, man. I'm I'm a columnist for the local paper in San Diego, syndicated, and I'm writing articles. I write an opinion column. Opinion column. That means I write my opinions. And I email to the paper, and they decide they're going to print it or not. They don't print it, I don't get paid. They print it, I get paid. So one day I'm driving around Southern California, and I'm cruising the streets, and, and the editor calls me to complain about my opinion <laughs> in an opinion page. And I'm listening to him, and he's lecturing me. This is serious, Mason. I'm just laughing. I'm laughing. He just, this is serious. You can't do this. You can't say that. You can't say this. I'm just laughing and laughing. He says, why are you laughing? This is very serious. I say, it is to you, because you got a job. <laughs> it is to you. It's, it's serious to you. It is play to me. Don't print it. Don't, don't worry about it. Folks, I say it, felt, it feels so good to be free of you. I am free. Don't print it. That's freedom, folks. You have to have that vision in your mind. When, when you act like you're going to get it, you begin to do things that lead you toward that goal. When I was in college, I kept, you know, I kept hearing these, these professors. I often felt that the professors really did not have my best interest at heart. Uh, mainly because they were all broke. And I, and I couldn't understand how, how they could teach me to make money when they didn't have any money. Uh, I, I thought it was really odd that businesses endowed colleges to train employees, not competitors. So I'm wondering how am I going to get my education to be free from people who already enslaved themselves. I was just confused. So one day I had an argument. I, it was a, really a discussion with my professor. It was a, a discussion. Uh, he was wrong and I was right. And he didn't realize it at the time. Uh, I, I called him. I finally realized what it was that we had a problem with, and I addressed that to him. I said, uh, sir, I see the problem. I'm a capitalist, and you are a socialist. And I am, I am a, um, uh, a person who believes that your standard of living will harm us. So I have, I, I've discovered that you are a communist, and, and, and that's why I have a problem with you. So the professor said, well, Mason, you're just a, uh, a sophomore in college. I got a PhD in political science. You would know a communist if you fell on one. And I said, well, yes, sir. I, actually, I went to Vietnam before I went to Berkeley, and I learned 
to recognize the communists in Vietnam. But there's a difference, though, between the communists in Vietnam and the communists at Berkeley. He said, what's the difference? I said, well, sir, in Vietnam, we got to shoot them. <laughs> he didn't think it was quite that funny, but <laughs> the fact is you must know who you are, folks. You must understand and maintain who you are. You have to understand why the world wants you to be enslaved, why they want you to be in the position where you think it's okay, where you think it's desirable to work all your life to support their lifestyle. They have a vested interest in your fears. See, fear is designed to freeze you where you are. Fear never motivates you. It always demotivates you. Fear keeps you right in place. Courage motivates you. Courage gets you off, the, off your feet, onto where you're going. But the world wants you to think there's something wrong with you, which is this goal you have to be free of them. And that's how they manifest it. You know, that, that woman who's pregnant, I've told this story before, and the woman who's pregnant will give birth to that child, even though that child in the womb is loved and nourished and fed and read to and kept warm and comforted in the womb, it has never known anything but the womb. It's been there all of its life. No one says, one day you're going to be free, mama. One day you're going to be on your own. No one told the baby that it's going to be free, but still, in all that love, the baby will struggle to be free of mother because freedom is natural. The mother gives birth, brings the child home, and keeps it fed and loved and nourished and burped and cleaned and changed and just everything the child wants. Every whimper at night, the mother's up attending to the child's needs. The mother rocks the child to sleep every day. And in spite of all that love and comfort, that child will struggle out of her arms onto the floor to crawl because freedom is natural. So the child crawls around on a dirty floor and one day he pulls herself up on the coffee table thinking about walking, thinking about it. I may try this. Thinking about it, but thinking also about falling. So the child will what? Let go of the table and his mind is on not walking, but on falling. So he falls. Bam. He'll laugh or cry, whatever it is. Doesn't matter. He's going to get up again and try it again. His mind is on falling, so he sets it down. He falls again. The child will fall, doctors tell me, 300 times before the first step. Failing 300 times in a row, never succeeding, never, never getting to, ahead of itself, never getting to the goal, always falling 300 times before the first step. But the baby doesn't matter. I'm going to walk. I'm going to walk. I'm going to walk. And what happens? When the baby gets tired of falling, stops thinking about the floor, so think about that step. When the baby gets tired of falling, it will walk. Because you know what walking is? It's just control falling. You fall forward and catch yourself. You stand up again, you fall forward again and catch yourself. If you don't believe me, you stand up in a minute when I'm finished, you try to walk leaning backwards. Your head goes forward and you go forward. And the baby learns to control its falling. The baby cannot learn if you try to keep the baby from falling. It will never walk. You have a 30-year-old man unable to walk if you try to keep the baby from falling. The baby has the head must meet that wall. I talk about my book, How I Learned What Hot Was. How I, and and it's, it's okay to leave the plantation. I talked about how I learned what the word hot meant. We had a big black pot belly stove in Missouri, and we kept it hot all through the wintertime. I hated the winter. I went to Vietnam to get out of St. Louis. I stayed by that stove. I was two years old. I stayed by that stove day and night. Hot, hot. They put coal in it. That's how hot it was. Black pot belly stove run by coal. My mother and grandmother kept saying, be careful, it's hot, the stove is hot, be careful, hot. I knew that me getting close to the stove got them excited, but I didn't, I didn't understand what hot was. It got them excited. One day, the stove introduced me to hot. <laughs> yep. One day, I, I just touched it with the back of my arm, just, to, just touched it. I then knew exactly, precisely what hot was. Mother could never tell me what hot was. 
That stove identified to me. And I saw one, everybody else, that stove was hot. Watch out for that stove, it's hot. <laughs> a few years later, though, we went to a carnival where they had, it was fire week. And the fire captain said that if you try to leave a, a burning room, you put your hands, your back of your hands to the, to the door before you open the door up. If it's hot, don't go in the door. About a year or so later, I'm upstairs on the third floor with my brother playing in the attic. And we hear the adults say, you boys, get out the house. The house is on fire. I take my little brother, my older brother, and we start walking out. We, we figured we'd go out the back door, the back step, lead out to the, to the, to the um, backyard, and we can just get out that way. We got to that back door, and I stopped for a minute. I remembered that pot belly stove. And I said, we better check this thing first. Put my back of my hand to that. I'm only like six years old. Put the back of my hand to that back door. And I said, it's hot in there. We're not going in there. I took my big brother down the front steps because in that back room was where the fire was. Now, what would have happened if my mother had protected me so much that that pop belly stove could not teach me what hot was and that fire in the back room did teach me what hot was? You cannot overprotect. All you are today, folks, think about who you are as an individual, what you've accomplished in life. Everything you've accomplished in life has come through things you've overcome, not things you've avoided. It has come from problems you have faced and worked through. Everything who's made you who you are. If I asked you how you go diamond, how you stay married 30 years, how you grow a business, how you get a college degree, if I start asking you how you do anything that's successful, you will start listing for me the problems you overcame, that you faced and overcame. Because overcoming is natural because success is natural. Take that baby again. The baby learns to walk. It is not satisfied. Folks keep saying, Mason, don't forget where you came from. Then why are you leaving where you are then? If you don't want to forget where you came from, stay where you are. The baby starts walking. You think the baby thinks about how good it was just crawling? It sure was good when I was just crawling. The baby don't sit back and think about how good it was when it learns how to ride a bicycle, how good it was with a tricycle. And right now at home, your kids are worried about your car because freedom is natural. It's the next logical step. It is a natural progression, but something happens at adulthood. Something goes on. You become an adult, you become responsible citizens and dependable and loyal and slaves. There is a difference between a slave and a prisoner. We talked about it. I want to go over it again in case you missed it last year. A prisoner and a slave. There is a difference between a prisoner and a slave. You do not want to be anywhere near slaves. Because a slave thinks that freedom is pleasing master and getting the best job on the plantation. The slave will sit down and tell you about his 40 years at the company job and a union stewardship and how great he is with his pension. The slave will tell you he's proud to retire on food stamps. The slave will discourage you. He will invite other folks to come and criticize you. The slave will tell you it will never, ever, ever work. What do you mean I can be free of master? Master, feed me from this bowl. I have this bowl in my hand. I got to get fed here. Every problem a slave has requires master to act. When my son was four years old, everything he needed in life required me to do something. When he was hungry, I had to act. When he was cold, I had to act. When he wanted to go to bed or get up or go to school, I had to act. Everything he desired in life required me because I was dad. He's 31 now. Nothing requires me anymore. So he's free of me until he's broke. No, no, no. No, no honestly, my son will never, either one of my sons will never call me for, for any money because they, they, had, they, they got very good Christmas birthday gifts on the 18th birthday. It was luggage, a pair of luggage. <laughs> and they were encouraged to let us know where they stay, to come, back, <laughs> come back and visit. They're very independent because I let them fall. I know they had to learn to walk. They had to learn to walk. My, my son said, my dad, I want to stay home like you stay home. I said, okay, first thing we can do is drop 2,800 pounds on you. <laughs> We're going to make it work here. 
Folks, you have to go through the problems. You cannot go around them. You cannot avoid them. They are good for you. The problems are good for you. The fertilizer in your life will stimulate you and get you to where you're strong and sturdy because the storms are coming. The storms are coming. And my wife and I went up to San Francisco for Christmas to see her brother, in-laws and outlaws. <laughs> my favorite park is Golden Gate Park. Well, when you go into the park, you got these big, tall, beautiful, elegant redwood trees. And they're great. They're 30, 40, 50, 60 feet tall, straight up. You drive westward towards the ocean, the trees get a little, little shorter, a little stumpier, shorter branches on them. You get to the shore, and they got trees growing out of rocks on the Pacific coast, facing those winter storms coming in. And they're growing out of rock. They're twisted grotesquely in, in, in the wind. They're facing back east. And they got really short stems on them. Looking ugly to most folks. I think they're beautiful. Because if you go there after a winter storm and drive through the park, those trees in the front, in the eastern side, big tall trees with shallow roots because they haven't had any problems in their life, fall over. Because there's no, there no stimulation for the roots to go deep. You go inwards, as you get closer to the, to the hazards, the roots become more sturdy, the trees are a little more stronger, but those trees on the coast facing the, the direct wind and the high waves, they're still standing. You have to dig those roots deep, folks, and be able to let nothing move you from your goals because they will try. You have to understand in life, everybody wants you to fail except folks going where you're going. And you have to de de deliver to them the ability to have what you want and what they want. You see, knowledge is power. If knowledge is power, what's ignorance? Powerless. Find out what's happening. Study. The reason you study is that so that you can have the knowledge to get you over the top. You know, there are people who always try to tell you what can't be done, and they're always the loudest. Uh, there's an old proverb that says, um, someone who thinks it cannot be done should get out of the way of those getting it done. I flew into San Diego right at the end of the fo football game, Super Bowl game. Every Super Bowl Sunday, I'm on a plane flying back from one of these functions. And I got there just as, as, as the pass was thrown and caught for that first down that ended up winning the game. And I began to think, you know, nobody ever says it's just a game when their team is winning. Just a game, just a game. Folks, it's not a game. This is for real. But people want you to be able to sit back one day and work hard. Folks, it's not personal. It's just personal. It's not that someone hates you and they want to enslave you and make you work for 15, 30, 40 years. It's not that they hate you. It's that they love their children. If they can get you to work for their children, that's a deal for them. If they can get you to slave all your life to take care of their kids, it's not personal. It's just personal. They love their children. And if you love your children, you want to say, no, I'm not going to raise your kids. I'm going to raise mine. I'm going to sit back and not worry about it. It is your natural instinct to be economically free. It is the next step from crawling to walking to running now to flying. It's the next step to sit back and think about things in, in a certain way, to visualize things in a certain way that you can stand up and say, I'm going to have this work. Now, how it works is very easy. It's very easy. You follow those who've been there. You follow people who have gotten to where they are by helping people like you get to where they are. You don't follow somebody who's gotten where they are by stepping on folks like you. You follow folks who've gotten where they are from helping people like you. I think you see the few up here. You can analyze a few. There was a, um, you know, you know, there was a young man, two, two monks. I heard this story once. I thought it was pretty fascinating. There was two monks walking along a river, and they had taken a vow of silence from sunrise to sunset. The river had been flooded, and it was kind of overflowing. And on the side where they were, there was a woman who wanted to get across. And she asked the monks, would they please take her across? Now, the monks had also took a vow to never touch a woman. And the woman needed help, and one of the monks just picked her up, 
This said word, picked her up and carried her across the river and put her down, and the two monks continued on about their business. Finally, sunset came, and they could speak. And the second monk said to the first monk, you touched that woman. You carried her across the river. How could you put your hands on that woman? You carried her across the river. The first monk said to the second monk, I put her down on the other side of the river. It was you who carried her around all day. <laughs> Let it go. All the problems, all the disappointments, the racist coach who told me that I wouldn't start because he didn't want me to take a scholarship from the white players. The racist school counselor said that I would take a job from another white person. By the way, I saw him again one year. That was really interesting. I was walking down the city, this little small town we lived in, and I saw him. And I went up to him and said, Mr. Ralph, I want to thank you. He said, thank you for what? I said, you're an inspiring teacher. You're an inspiring man. I know you did it on purpose. You're such a slick little dude, man. I know you did that on purpose. I went to Berkeley and got three degrees in two and a half years from Berkeley. And every time I got tired, every time I got depressed, every time I got overworked, overstimulated, the pain pills got too hard, every time I felt like just giving up, I would think about you. <laughs> Do I want to call you on the phone and see you sticking that job opening for me down in the shoe factory? You know, can I still work for you? Every time I got tired, I would think about you. And Mr. Ruff, I appreciate the encouragement you gave me, you are a great counselor. He looked all wide-eyed. At the time, I was working for a U.S. congressman. And he just said, you're doing what? I said, yeah, I'm working for a U.S. congressman. Folks, forgive. Let it go. The school would not let me graduate. A racist shipmate tried to kill me. Let it go. Your mother beat you. Your husband disappeared on you. Your kids are, are bad. Let it go. It's not yours anyway. Let it go. If you let it go, you realize that you got more power than you can ever imagine. You can stand one day on your own two feet and get to a point in life that you never even dreamed of. I grew up in a house with one black and white television set that was only on during the news. I grew up in a, in a place that, that nobody ever owned anything. I remember one day a guy wanted to sell me a bicycle for five bucks. I thought it was too expensive. So I tried to, try to make one myself. You know, Bobby Knight, the Indiana University football player, made a statement. Everybody, everybody has the urge and the will to win. Everybody. But I was reading Judges Clarence Thomas' new book, my, my grandfather's son, and he made the statement in there that says, yes, everybody has the will to win, but not everybody has the will to earn it, to win, to learn to win, to do the work to win. What he said exactly was that everybody, but nobody has the will to prepare to win. You have the will to win and the urge to win, but do you have the urge to prepare to win? Preparing to win means that you have to go out and look at this business and your life like it's a child you're raising. This business must be your child. Just like your child, you expect this business to take care of you in your old age. Just like your child. You got to feed it and nurture it, protect it, and make sure you have the right education, the right people around it. You will not bring child molesters to your child to babysit. <laughs> Therefore, you don't bring some of these slaves into your business to try to make it, make it beneficial. You need prisoners. So I was giving the analogy between the slave and the prisoner. The slave wants to keep master happy, not themselves. The slaves are afraid that if you escape, they look bad for a master. They're going to pull you down, tell you it's not going to work, pour grease on your, on your rope, and try to make sure that everybody around you is discouraged. The slave's job is to make sure that you do not be successful. He doesn't want freedom for himself or for you. But the prisoner, in that same environment, the prisoner knows that over that wall is freedom. The prisoner knows if I can get around it, under it, through it, I can be free. The prisoner does not have to be told about freedom. The prisoner just has to be told about the rope. And you present the rope. What the rope is, folks, is opportunity. 
And you can judge by how they handle your information if they are a prisoner or a slave. They will tell you immediately. The slave thinks the rope is to lynch him. He thinks you're going to kill him. He thinks you're going to take him away what he deserves. I have worked here for three generations. I deserve my pension. They take my Social Security every month. They tax me when they take it. They tax me when they bring it back to me when I retire. I deserve to retire. You should say, thank you very much for telling me who you are. And move on to find that prisoner. The prisoner will tie a knot in the rope. Every time you come to a meeting, it's a knot in your rope. Every time you show the plan, every time you listen to a tape, every time you show the opportunity, you are putting a knot in your rope. And even though the slaves and your family and your friends will put grease on it, the bigger the ropes are, it doesn't matter. And a, a prisoner will climb out and tell his friends where the rope is. I'm at the mall in, in Hawaii. My wife and I went to Hawaii in, February, in uh, January. I'm at the mall. Uh, Sid had a high maintenance wife, so we go to the mall. We, we, we tour malls. So I'm in, <laughs> I'm in the mall, and you know how you got the kiosks with the people in the middle of the mall selling products and stuff like this? And you walk by, and everybody's sitting there reading the paper. They're supposed to be selling stuff. And they're reading the papers, and they're doing crossword puzzles, and they're all bored. This one guy, I walked by, one guy said, sir, do you have a cell phone? I said, well, yeah. He said, well, my, my service is really great. I said, well, tell me about your service. Tell me what's going on. He started telling me about the products and what he had to offer. And I asked the guy, I said, are you going to be here in five years? He said, no, 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 I'm not going to be here in five years. I said, what are you going to be doing in five years? Folks, he showed me the plan. <laughs> he had a plan. He showed me the plan. I'm going to have some income. He's, he knew exactly what he wanted. He didn't know how to get it. That's not difficult. The world nowadays, folks, the world is in panic right now. People are afraid. They're afraid that the economy is going bad. They're hearing everybody saying the economy is bad. They're, they're hearing them say that, that things are going to explode, explode. We have the stock market going down. We got the uh, foreclosure rates going up. It's all artificial, but people are scared anyway. And when they're scared, they remember how energetic and how confident you are in being free. They're going to ask you questions. They're going to start saying, Tell me again about this opportunity I had to be free. They're panicking now. In my neighborhood, man, folks, the property value is dropping and dropping and dropping. People are panicking, and I'm buying property. <laughs> I'm buying property in California. It's supposed to be bad. I, folks, I buy your land, too. I'm buying, because one thing about California, even though the property value is going down, everybody wants to live there. And they all have high incomes and bad credit which means they can't buy anything. I went and brought my wife a, car, a truck um, a, few months, a few months ago, and we were debating and arguing with the guy about, see, what I do, I go in and, and make you finance it first before I pay cash for it. Because when you finance it, you give me a great deal. You got that finance charges. You think you're getting paid with finance charges. So I get, I get that great deal, then I go in the back and I pay cash for it. So I'm, I'm debating the guy on interest rates, right? And this is a big tent sale. They got thousands of folks in there. And they're going through all this mess, and, and, and the salesperson is trying to give me this 8.5% interest rate on a car. I'm saying, GS seems kind of high to me. I don't know. So I asked his supervisor, what is my credit rating? And the supervisor said, <sighs> right? Because I, I guess I wasn't supposed to know. He sighed and said, actually, it's the highest credit rating I've seen all weekend here. Everybody coming in here. I guess we can lower the interest rate a little bit for you. I wrote a check for the car. Freedom, folks. You have to understand that if you desire to be free, freedom will come to you. It is natural. It is natural. But you cannot let that slave determine who you are. This business is the Underground Railroad. This business is just like Harriet Tubman and all my other heroes. They went out at night to knock on doors and said, Master is lying to you about freedom. Master is telling you to work for him is freedom. I'm telling you, I have been to freedom. I know where freedom is. Freedom is natural. I know the way. If you follow me, I will take you all the way. If you get lost, I'm going to find you. If you stumble, I'll pick you up. I will never leave you. But you've got to get up 
and you got to walk. You got to be afraid. It's going to be dark. It's going to be scary. It's going to be rainy, but you got to walk with me all the way. I will never leave you. I will never, never abandon you. I will take you all the way to the goal if you get up and follow me. The train is leaving. Casey's pulling out the station. He's leaving the freedom. Either you're going to stay with him or you're going to stay behind. Either you're going to be free or you're going to end up being a slave. The train is leaving. Be right or be left. We are going to freedom. God bless you. Let's have a Mr. Mason! Wait up!